kind of world do I want to live in? I think about this question a lot. For our generation and for specifically my group of people, which is refugees, the circumstances might dismantle any vision of the future that we have. You're trying to rebuild, you're trying to make a future for yourself, and then the climate related disaster comes and you start again. It's not about how it's affecting you now, it's about how it's affecting you your entire life. First step to understand is that we're all a part of it. None of us are going to be left out by the crisis. We're at a stage where if we don't act now, really there won't be very much left. There are generations that will never see certain things that we grew up seeing in real life. We have to start treating this like the emergency it is. To achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we have to go from an intention to a serious commitment. Business leaders really need to rethink how they conduct their business and invest in creating systems that are climate friendly. Action I would like to see is accountability. Structures being put in place where countries aren't just asked to do something, but they're kept accountable to the decisions that they make. There has to be that strong collaboration between government, between corporations, between youth activists to drive change forward. The world I would want to live in is a world where imagining the future is not a privilege. I want to live in a world where people do not give up on hope, hope that a positive change is possible. The fact that you're listening today means that you are willing to make a change. Hello and a good morning to you all. Uh, my name is Fifi Peters. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, we knew that technology and the fourth industrial revolution could help Africa uh, leapfrog its development. Uh, we had been speaking about it for quite a number of years. But the pandemic provided the proof in the pudding that it can be done. And we saw rapid acceleration of digital technologies and adoption over the past 18 months. And uh, so we uh, continued to leverage under lockdowns and we continued to go on business unusually, as it were, as a result of the lockdowns forcing many of us to do things remotely. What we have seen in the past 18 months in terms of how Africa has acclimatized to a technology is only the tip of the iceberg in terms of how we can leverage it. There's still a lot more that we can do and a lot more that Africa should do to grow its economies and to grow it inclusively and sustainably. And so we have a conversation this morning on scaling Africa's digital transformation and how best that can be done. Let me introduce you to the panelists that I will be having this conversation with this morning, beginning with Minister Joseph Mucheru, the Cabinet Secretary for Information, Communications and Technology, Innovation and Youth Affairs of Kenya, Ms. Crystal Rujeje, Managing Director of the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution of Rwanda, Mr. Ken Hu, the Deputy Chairman of Huawei Technologies, and Ms. Natalie Paide Jabengwa, the Group Digital Executive Officer of Sunlam. Good morning to you all. Good morning. Minister, if you allow me to begin with you, sir, because what we have seen is that Kenya has largely led the region's digital transformation particularly in the fintech sector. What are your views on how Kenya and the region can leverage digital transformation, sir, to achieve the sustainable development goals? 
Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity that you've given us to be able to participate. Uh, and let me say, you know, technology is dear to us and uh, I believe is one of the things that really will help Africa leapfrog. So as a country, in order to be able to leverage the technologies and all the new areas that are coming up, we must ensure that we have the right policies uh, in place and, and strategies that uh, can then be used as the roadmaps to implement and for people to see how um, the governments are looking at this area and how we can be able to proceed and, and grow. So as Kenya, we are very happy first that we have a very large uh, youth uh, dividend. I think we have 75.5% um, of, of our population being just youth. So these are 35 million uh, under the age of 35. They are very uh, technology savvy and we've seen that we can use the technology to be able to work with them, whether it is in creating jobs, whether it's in being able to provide the services that uh, are required, whether it is for education, for entertainment, these have been very key for us. And, and so even at an early age, we have ensured that um, within the schools, we have the right curriculum, we've put in the right uh, infrastructure so that they can already begin to interact and engage uh, with the technologies within government. We're ensuring that many of our services are now going digital so that other than even the ID, where we're putting a digital ID, we're ensuring that um, government services can be offered across the country from wherever you are just using the technology. So laying of the infrastructure such as fiber, 4G, 3G um, technologies across in terms of networks it is critical. So we as a government want to work very closely with the private sector and to be able to do that, we must have the right policies on how they can, uh, the private sector can invest, protect their investment and be able to grow and continue to innovate in the ways that uh, are necessary. So, so these are the things that we are putting in place as government. We have worked closely with the rest of the region and the continent uh, under the Smart Africa um, initiative. And within that, uh, we have uh, planned the, 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 the digital economy blueprint. Our president launched that in Kigali. And we're working now with many of the other countries that have different blueprints that we're using for rolling out. So that, for instance, for our citizens, there is no roaming charges when you go to the initial 37 countries. You know, you can be able to use your number so you don't have to be a different person when you go to each country and change your SIM card. Uh, mobile money interoperability from one country to another. And really with the continental free trade area, um, you know, within Africa, you know, we're talking 1.3 billion people. Then we have a great market and opportunity to be able to leverage and grow. So these are some of the areas that we're looking at and, and really the collaboration and partnerships that we have are allowing us to be able to move uh, that much faster and, and live forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Minister. And uh, suppose staying in the region and in Rwanda specifically, where uh, it is now home to the Centre for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, thanks to the collaboration between government, uh, between the Ministry of ICT and Innovation, as well as the World Economic Forum. And so, Crystal, uh, I'd like to ask you if you could just share your view on how the Rwanda Centre for the Fourth Industrial Revolution is shaping the digital transformation in Rwanda and the region. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Fifi, and uh, good morning to uh, my fellow panelists. It's uh, it's a privilege to be a part of this important discussion. So, you know, as you mentioned, I'm leading a new uh, entity called the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution um, here in Rwanda, and we are part of a global network of 13 centers around the world um, that were established by the World Economic Forum um, and in partnership with the government uh, host governments around the world. Um, so, the Rwanda Center and and really broadly the Center Network. Um, what are 
mission is, is to really ensure that the fourth industrial revolution is not just uh, a revolution that benefits uh, the privileged few, um, but really all of society. And so how do we do this? You know, we co-design governance frameworks through continuous multi-stakeholder engagement and rapid piloting at a local level, a uh, continental level and a global level. Um, and, and oftentimes I'm asked, why is technology governance such an important issue? Um, but we often have a scenario where the private sector is taking the elevator while the government is taking the stairs when it comes to regulating um, many of these emerging technologies like drones, artificial intelligence, um, for example. Um, but, but the reality is, is that um, both the public sector and the private sector have a lot to learn um, in deeply understanding how to fully maximize the benefits, but also minimizing you know, the inherent risks that uh, emerging technology uh, introduces in, into society. And so what we are trying to do is really ensure um, that we are accelerating you know, these benefits to society in an inclusive and, and responsible manner. So at the center um, here in Rwanda, we're, we're focused on two platform areas. One is artificial intelligence and the other is data policy. Um, and the two really go hand in hand. You can't begin to talk about digital transformation um, or things like artificial intelligence and machine learning without talking about data. Um, and I think it's really important that we that we all recognize data as a strategic asset for countries, uh, for businesses, um, and for individuals. And so at the center, you know, over the past year, uh, our first year of operation, uh, really, uh, we decided to prioritize a, a good uh, chunk of our work around a critical piece of legislation on personal data protection and privacy. Um, and, and this was recently adopted by Parliament and, and is also soon to be gazetted. Um, but really what we aim to achieve uh, with this critical piece of legislation is first and foremost empowering citizens uh, to have agency over their personal data. Um, secondly, is, is really being able to um, uh, enable trusted and secure data flows, and not just domestically, because we don't, uh, we can't operate within an island. Uh, you know, we 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 need to do this internationally as well, um, and ensuring that cross-border data flows are possible. And lastly, being able to provide regulatory certainty um, for businesses. And so, you know, data is at the heart of digital the digital transformation agenda. And this specific law is a very important step um, in Rwanda, but even in the context as we. Uh, try to do business with the region and the rest of the world and creating an enabling environment for technology innovation, being able to attract investment, because we all see this as a key driver of economic growth. Uh, Mr. Hu, uh, coming to you, so can you just uh, perhaps give us the uh, perspective from the private sector in terms of what you are seeing on the ground here in Africa? Because Huawei is working closely with a number of African partners in its attempt to uh, accelerate uh, the level of digitization, as it were. I, I mean, you have brought 5G to many parts of the continent, including here in South Africa. So for that, uh, I thank you. But can you tell us what you are seeing on the ground and uh, what is essentially happening, sir? Thank you very much, Vivi, for the question. And uh, it's a great pleasure to join the discussion about the digital transformation across Africa. Um, in recent years, I have traveled to many African countries and I have observed great progress in connectivity, particularly the mobile broadband connectivity across Africa. And let me give you an example. From the network perspective, just in the past five years, the coverage of 4G network in Africa has increased from 11% to 49%. In fact, in South Africa, is, South Africa is already developing the 5G. This is an incredible progress in such a short term. However, compared to the rest of the world, the gap in Africa is still large, not only in network coverage, but also in the usage. For example, in sub-Saharan uh, sub Africa, 16% of people still don't have any wireless coverage, not even on Tuesday. More importantly, from the usage perspective, only 26% people are using the mobile internet in Africa versus 49% globally. 
and the penetration of social media in Africa is also lower than the rest of the world, just 11% versus 47% globally. I think there are two major barriers behind those gaps, the affordability and the lack of digital skills. For example, the smartphone is expensive in Africa. Many of us today have more than one device, a smartphone, a pad, a laptop. But the situation in Africa is, is different. In some low-income community, a simple smartphone can cost more than 80% of monthly wage. So as a result, the smartphone penetration in Africa is just 44%. However, if we look at the situation in Southeast Asia, the penetration is almost 100%. So the, the gap is big. But how, how we can deal with those gaps? The good news is that today, the demand for digital service and digital technology in Africa is massive. It's just like anywhere else in the world. For example, the mobile money is huge in Kenya right now, and it's making financial service more inclusive, more inclusive and people really love it. So we can extend these benefits to, to, to other sectors, but we need to join the effort, particularly the partnership between the private and public sector, which was repeatedly um, mentioned by previous speakers. So here I would like to share some of my thoughts. First, the government can take measures to encourage investment in broadband infrastructure. For example, to release spectrum faster and to provide subsidies when needed. Second, the industry, like the company of Huawei, can help create more affordable devices and network solutions for basic connectivity. And finally, to improve the digital skills, the public and private sectors need to work together to improve digital curriculum in school and provide training in remote regions. So generally speaking, the digital demand in Africa is massive. The progress is incredible. However, more joint effort is needed to, to further promote the digital transformation across Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, to promote the digital transformation and also to uh, narrow the uh, present digital uh, gap. Uh, Natalie, to come to you for your uh, opening comments, ma'am, just in terms of the mushrooming of the uh, fintech and insurtech industries that we have seen throughout the course of the pandemic, could you please give us your take on digital transformation as it does pertain to your sector in terms of financial resiliency as well as prosperity? Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. I think uh, it goes without saying that the role of digital transformation in Africa should really drive shared equity and shared prosperity. I think there are two things that really spurring um, digital transformation in Africa. And first and foremost, that is the advancement in the digital infrastructure. And that is also the changing consumer trends. The advancements in um, digital infrastructure is the penetration of more digitally enabled devices. And I think access to internet penetration has fundamentally changed how our consumers globally, not just on the African continent, uh, consume, transact, communicate, uh, live, and basically get on on their day-to-day -day basis. And I think it goes without saying that as a result of these changes, private sector has been forced to deliver its services in a transformed way. And that has really ushered us into the fourth industrial revolution. On the Africa continent specifically, I think we have leapfrogged where we had not fundamentally developed on the basic uh, infrastructure architecture, uh, which is your, 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 your access to home broadband. Um, and I think although we are predominantly on feature phones and are using USSD capabilities, it goes without saying that just that has allowed Africa to innovate in very, very different ways to the rest of the world. In comparison, I think where we are is probably where China was 20 years ago. And there is drive and scope, given that Africa by 2050 will be the fastest growing continent in the world and will have the propensity in terms of demographic uh, 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 representation of the youngest population on earth. And now if you have a look at that, 
And these consumer trends that I'm talking about, there is no continent that is readier than Africa in my perspective to be able to deliver on this. And so private sector, particularly telcos, have been moving very quickly into adjacent value chain industries, typically mostly financial services and disrupting how financial services is accessed by the masses and by the populace. And there's been the rise of mobile money that we speak about, delivering financial services in a way that banks fail to deliver in 100 years. And I think it is an opportune time uh, to push further on advanced financial services. And for us at the Sunlam Group, it's looking at things like insurance, it's looking at things like access to uh, credit, it's looking to things like um, wealth management uh, value propositions in equities and stocks for the mass and using um, digital uh, infrastructure, particularly that one which is handheld and digital customer interaction platforms to drive education and awareness uh, for this. But I think beyond the private sector, if we talk on social equity and resilience, something that's really coming through is the ability to create jobs and certainly COVID goes without saying, Asha doesn't force all of us to deliver a digital workforce change fundamentally how we're supposed to uh, uh, work in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a crisis and make it more digital if, if the gospel on digital itself uh, was, was still unbelieved. Uh, but also I think when we talk about resilience, it's ability now to use digital even further beyond financial services into climate action, tearing up our actions as consumer citizens into the transactions and into the way that we actually drive, drive commerce and enabling trade. And I think uh, uh, Mrs. Crystal Rugege already sp Rugege spoke about that and an honorable minister already talked about that and, and how it is important to use digitization as that unique identifier that actually drives further commerce on the continent. Education, healthcare goes without saying that the pandemics revealed how further important the role of digitization uh, is uh, for us. So I, I think these are my, my, my early remarks in terms of the importance of uh, digitization and shared equity, resilience and prosperity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks, Natsi. I think that the panel has uh, uh, introduced the uh, topic quite well, just laying the groundwork uh, for uh, what we need to see a lot more of happening from uh, a favorable policy environment that can encourage uh, further private sector investments, uh, from a greater collaboration that will be needed amongst all stakeholders to uh, create a shared value system. But also when we uh, talk about the uh, digital economy, we can't talk about the digital economy without also including a very important element to it, and that is energy and the lack of, in the case of the continent, which uh, is, 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 is presently the status quo. Today, the uh, Regional Action Group uh, for Africa, in collaboration with uh, Deloitte, has published a, a report on financing the future of energy. Because as I just said, if we don't have uh, power, we don't have uh, internet and we won't have digital transformation. So just speaking about this report uh, more uh, closely, given that uh, right now digital transformation is no longer a nice to have, it's uh, no longer something that's even optional, it's, it's a necessity. So I'd like to ask the panel to just uh, comment on the, the, the energy debate, as it were, beginning with you once again, Minister. Uh, Minister Mucheru, the white paper does speak of enabling technical expertise required to support the energy transition. How do you see the role of African youth in innovation? You spoke about the demographic dividend. You spoke about how it is a, it is a, is a big opportunity there. But just flesh out the details within the context of energy, sir. Thank you again, Fifi, and, and I'm really happy that um, we're very aligned as a panel. I, I really associate with many of the comments that uh, my fellow panelists have uh, said, and, and listening to them also just reminds me of how far we have come. I mean, for a long time, we did not even have fiber connectivity into the continent. Uh, you know, it was only on the, on the Western side. And, and now we are talking about uh, energy and power and uh, devices. We're talking about smartphones. We're talking about 5G. It, it's, it's really a great conversation. And so, again, I want to thank the World Economic Forum um, just for making this uh, conversation happen. 
Before I joined the government, I was uh, working at Google and uh, I was the head of Google Energy in Africa. And part of the reason that Google was uh, in Africa, uh, initially we were looking at deployment and getting as many people online as possible. And we identified that power was one of the critical uh, you know, ingredients that was needed to be able to grow uh, the use of the internet. And not just power, but reliable power and affordable power. And so during that time, we even uh, put in investments in uh, wind power in Kenya, solar power in South Africa, and so on. And that was, you know, in my private sector days. But I would say coming into government, it's become even more clear that if we do not have power in, um, you know, in the rural areas, if our citizens don't have access, not only will they be unable to study uh, and uh, have their own micro businesses and all the things that are required, but they'll be left out in this digital transformation. So I would say one of the big uh, investments that uh, our government here in Kenya has done is really to get us uh, over 80% people now connected to the grid, moving from about 35%, because power is that important. But with that, we have seen the growth of uh, use of broadband, the growth of use of technology across the country. And if we had not put that investment, we would not have seen the kind of, I would say, stability and ability to grow that has been there during this uh, you know, COVID-19 pandemic period, where you know, people have in some times been in lockdowns, they've not been able to travel, and they've been able to leverage and use technology significantly. I would have had to travel maybe to South Africa or somewhere to be able to have this panel discussion. But here we are saving time, saving money, and really the investment in energy is, uh, is very critical. We look at the new uh, areas of investment in our sector. Uh, for instance, Bitcoin mining or cryptocurrency mining, all these are linked uh, to power. But we need to go into areas where we consume as much power in manufacturing uh, and in all the other sectors so that the cost of this power comes down. There's no uh, smartphone right now that does not require to be charged um, on a regular basis. And, and the challenge many of our citizens have is because there's no access to power, then they will buy maybe a feature phone that will last them maybe a week or, or, or two before they get uh, to a place where there is this power. So we are very keen to see how we can ensure this infrastructure is available. Our young people now have started using you know, mo mobile phones, their laptops, tablets, working online. They've joined the gig economy. They are earning their money uh, even in the remotest parts of Africa. And here in Kenya, we now have over 1.2 million people working daily on the, in the gig economy whether it is transcriptions, whether it is translations, or they're simply just watching CCTVs uh, in Europe and in the US and being able to give feedback uh, to people out there. So, so this technology is enabling our youth uh, to be able to be gainfully employed, get the necessary money they need for the basic uh, needs. At the same time, they're bringing us foreign exchange without leaving the country. So I'm hoping that Kenya will you know, continue with its ambition of being the freelancing headquarters of the world. And we can leverage the continent's youth dividend to be able to service the rest of the world with all the skills that we have. So without right. power, we will not be able to do that. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Minister. Crystal, uh, COVID-19 having put uh, pressure on most countries' uh, infrastructure, uh, especially as it pertained to uh, connectivity and all of us needing to work from home at the same time. But how did Rwanda navigate this abrupt transition? And how has it elevated the importance of energy as a critical part of the digital inclusion agenda? Yeah, uh, thanks, Fifi. So, I, I mean, I think, you know, like the rest of the world, um, you know, Rwanda definitely experienced tremendous, you know, pressure to, you know, act uh, very quickly, you know, to adapt to um, the pandemic and, and the lockdowns and all of that. Um, you know, overnight, companies were, were obviously, you know, forced to equip their entire workforce to work remotely. Um, you know, similarly, schools had to try their best to keep kids um, learning and equip their teachers and staff with 
necessary um, you know, resources to, to keep that going. And while some businesses were able to you know, successfully transition, uh, we were definitely faced with a stark you know, reality that everyone doesn't have access to uh, consistent access to power. And even when they do, they may not be able to afford to consume you know, the amount of power required to have, to have the entire household you know, working from home or you know, all of their children studying from home at the same time. And so I think what, what the pandemic has done um, you know, for us in Rwanda, you know, very much like the rest of the world, it's amplified the severity you know, of the consequences that are caused by energy inequity. But I think that the good news is, is that from a policy perspective, it has demonstrated the urgency with which, with which uh, governments must act you know, to provide access to affordable power, uh, which then lends to affordable connectivity and also affordable devices, as, as the Honorable Minister already alluded to. You know, this is really what we need to move full steam ahead um, with the digital transformation agenda. And so I, I think you know, it's really important that we see equitable access to power um, as, as an imperative, really, um, if we are to deliver on, on the digital transformation agenda. Uh, Mr. Husso, just given the uh, unprecedented experience and demand for energy uh, resources over the past 18 months and also going into the future, what are some of the challenges you are seeing on your end and how is your industry planning to address this? Uh, yes, Vivi, uh, I, can, uh, I cannot agree with you more that the energy is, uh, is a key element in the digital transformation. No power, no internet, no digital transformation. According to the white paper that WAF just launched today, the energy demand in Africa will, will more than double by 2040. And right now, more than 50% of people in Africa has no access to electricity. From what I have observed, there are two main challenges behind this. Uh, one, limited power generation capacity. And second, transmit transmission network reach. There are, there are several, uh, several causes. For one, Africa's energy structure is not that diversified. Right now, it mostly relies on fossil fuels and hydropower, which are not flexible. And beyond that, traditional centralized grids and a long range transmission network take a long time to deploy. Time and resource are tight. So adapting to huge new demand is a big challenge. And I, and I believe that the top priority, priority should be to find an efficient, accessible, and affordable way to grow the power supply. From my perspective, there are three actions that we could take. First, the government can encourage investment to diversify the power supply. This includes funding from both private and public sectors and from international financial institutions. And second, adopt the solar and the wind power, not just because they are better for the environment, but because they are faster to deploy and more accessible than traditional grids. And third, African countries can leverage digital technology to make the most of renewable energies by optimizing power generation, transmission, and usage, and by expanding its energy mix to include more solar and wind power, this will help to address short-term supply challenges. It will also lay the foundation for a more sustainable energy supply in the long term in Africa, which is quite relevant. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And a, uh, a more sustainable Earth obviously as a result of the less harm that uh, renewables uh, provide to the environment. Natalie, just your, your view on or the technical expertise that will be required to support the energy transition, just from the prism perhaps of the youth and women in innovation in a digital transformation. I think it goes without saying that energy efficiencies will be required due to the digital gig economy. Uh, going forward. Ministers already fluently and eloquently stated the use of power in powering up these working tools that are, that are highly uh, uh, digital. And I think so better uh, battery access for digital 
uh, devices and infrastructure will be required as it will actually bring down as well the cost of energy. But I think another solution is how Africa can leverage and lead the world in going off the grid. Fundamentally, it goes without saying as a hopefully future uh, uh, area that um, um, investments and particularly financiers can, can, can look into as we retransform homes, as we retransform um, infrastructure uh, and, and the power bases that, uh, that, that, are, that, are right, that are running this. But maybe with regards to, uh, uh, to the youth, I think what is really important about the digital uh, opportunities that are well presented, especially um, with COVID, is the opportunity uh, for, for the youth who are more tech savvy or the digital natives uh, to be able to leapfrog uh, on this to further transform and to create innovative solutions that can actually, can actually drive particularly our continent into the future. But maybe perhaps even more astronomical for women who've traditionally always worked from the home and COVID has been so validating for, for, for women. Uh, when, we, when, when we look at that in comparison to, to, to men, women can lead from the front because they've always been leading from the front at home. Women have largely been the multitaskers in the home, looking after the children and making sure that everyone's sorted out. COVID provides that once of opportunity for women to actually accelerate new skills and setting up businesses where this becomes fundamentally normal. And I think it, 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 it is a new horizon, especially for the, for, 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 for the female gender. I know at least a lot of my male colleagues have been trying to figure out how you can work with children in the background, how you can teach children and, and still multitask around awful lot of other many things. And women for the, have been doing this for the longest time. I think there is an agenda, uh, no pun intended, that is further preferred for digitization as women lead nations, private sector, entrepreneurship, and innovation from the home front. I'm wondering if um, a relook at the compensation structures uh, needs to take place as a result of all the multitasking that uh, women are doing uh, both at home and in the workplace. Uh, but we have eight minutes left for this discussion, and I'd like to get some concluding remarks from the panel. Could I ask that uh, we keep our concluding statements to uh, two minutes each, just in the interest of time? Uh, Minister Joseph, just your key uh, takeaways that you'd like to leave us with, and uh, perhaps uh, speaking more closely to that collaboration you mentioned within the context of the Africa Free Trade Area deal here on the continent. If you thank you very much. Um, I would say that there are two things that are important. As we go into the technology space, we must be able to work together. And this is particularly when you look at uh, you know, some of the key challenges like cybersecurity, uh, which uh, affect us, fake news, and, and so on. These are key areas that without collaboration, we cannot be able to, to deal with those, whether it is people trying to hack, espionage, and so on. But I believe that we are poised as a continent now to be able to also innovate and start exporting technology to the rest of the world. We're exporting labor in terms of our young people so that they can be able to, to earn a living, but also contribute to the global digital economy. And I believe as Africa, we, you know, we have the opportunity and the time is now to fully take advantage with all the partnerships, uh, whether it is in the technology companies that we're working with or governments and private sector, academia. And, and I believe that is the way we can um, live from and move forward. And I'll just finish by saying that I believe Africa should also get into the mining of all these cryptos and all these cutting edge technologies, artificial intelligence, ensuring that our languages don't disappear where we'll only speak the Siri language uh, as opposed to our own languages. And I think those opportunities will come from our young people. Thank you, Fifi. Thank you, Minister. And Ken, just uh, a follow on from that. I imagine that uh, venturing into those new industries and uh, ways of doing things will require a whole lot more digital skills that you already cited as being in lack on the continent. Your final remarks and also how digital skilling in Africa can be improved. Oh, yes, this is a, this is a very important question. Um, uh, from my understanding, the digital skill is equally important uh, as 
the digital infrastructure and the energy supply across Africa. Just want to, just want to show you a couple of figures. By 2030, more than 230 million jobs in Africa will require digital skills. Uh, as I mentioned just now, more than half of people don't have a smartphone, not to mention basic digital skills. Professionally speaking, right now, only 2% of the labor force has IT skills. That's a huge gap, and we need to take joint immediate action to deal with those, the, those gaps. Um, the private and partner uh, partner uh, and the private and the public uh, partnership and the contribution from the industries are all needed. And I believe that um, with the joint action, if we can work together, I'm sure that we can lay a strong foundation for Africa's digital uh, future, uh, including the strong foundation for digital infrastructure, digital skills, and strong energy supply. Thank you, sir. Uh, Crystal, final uh, thoughts from you in uh, two minutes, uh, your uh, key takeaways, and also if there were one or two uh, issues that you'd like to bring to the attention of governments to help scale digitization, what would they be? Yeah, let me just focus on um, emphasizing the importance of data as a strategic asset and really making sure that um, the audience and particularly governments um, sees this as a priority. So, you know, if we really want to fully harness the benefits of the digital transformation agenda as a continent, we need a coordinated uh, data strategy. We need an interoperable data regulation uh, environment, and we also need harmonized data sharing frameworks. And so, you know, I, I would just like to invite policymakers, private sector leaders, uh, the young innovators we have with us, uh, researchers to connect with the center um, as we aim to shape Africa's data governance landscape, um, starting with Rwanda, uh, to be more inclusive, more progressive, and more secure, you know, so we can all accelerate our collective ambitions towards uh, becoming a technology-driven economy. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Natalie, final thoughts from you, perhaps also in this, the same vein, you can share uh, one or two uh, takeaways that some of your colleagues in the private sector can work on to scale us up. Oh, fantastic. Maybe with huge focus on the private sector is how technological capabilities become a fundamental bedrock on the economic development of Africa. And I think with broad focus on the Africa Free Trade Continental Agreement is how we can drive synergies across the continent I think data has already been mentioned, unique identification on how we can cross-pollinate um, access to, to, to trade and, 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 and commerce across uh, uh, the region, but also investment into education and awareness. I think Mr. Wu pointed uh, um, uh, on, on the importance of, uh, of, 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 of skills and how governments can actually also further uh, um, STEM education, particularly, and not just the traditional education, but leveraging on the... Um, Demograph uh, uh, the, the demographic uh, opportunity that the minister uh, uh, pointed on, which is it's in our in, in, in the youth uh, bulge uh, that, that that Africa is, is 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 sitting with, and then I think goes without saying how private sector can really uh, drive an ecosystem uh, uh, driven approach across all the value chains uh, by investing. Uh, in in technological um, capabilities that drive uh, not just return. Uh, to, 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 to equity for, for investors, but shared so, social equity uh, as well, so that we're all winning as one. Thanks very much indeed. And thank you. Uh, thank you to you all for your insights. I think that uh, wonderful ideas on the table. It seems like in general, uh, everyone knows what needs to be done to really scale up the level of uh, digital transformation on the uh, continent. But what did uh, feature quite prominently and what all of you have said this morning is the importance of a collaboration and strengthening the ties in moving forward uh, together. That is certainly something that uh, will be important even at the African Union level for it to even achieve its uh, goal, its target of creating a single digital market by uh, 2030. I, I look forward to uh, watching the development unfold as a, a practitioner in the media uh, because the uh, failure to act and to act now as uh, the minister, Minister Joseph has said, only risks economic isolation for the continent and uh, stagnation. 
But I'll leave it there and thank you once more for your valuable time and for your valuable insights. And also a thanking the audience who has been listening to this conversation that has been streamed. Thank you for giving us your morning as well.